Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Mitsui Lecture Series. I am Masami Tyson, board chair of the Japan America Society of Tennessee. The Mitsui Lecture Series is made possible by the generous support of the Mitsui USA Foundation. The lectures align with JAST's efforts to deliver thought-provoking programming and to highlight Japan's footprint around the world and its contributions to Tennessee's prosperity over the last 40 years. Now, Mike Fideli, Vice President and General Manager, Trade Services Center, Regional Officer of the Nashville Office of Mitsui and Company, USA Incorporated, and fellow JAST, treasure, JAST board member and treasurer joins us today. It is my pleasure to introduce Mike, who is going to talk about Mitsui. Mike? Thank you, Masami, and good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to represent Mitsui and JAST this afternoon for the Mitsui Lecture Series. A little background about Mitsui USA and the Mitsui USA Foundation. Mitsui USA, established in 1966, is the largest wholly owned subsidiary of Mitsui & Co headquartered in Tokyo, one of the largest Japanese trading and investment companies in the world. In addition to the traditional trading company business, Mitsui USA engages in business investment, project development and management, and capital goods leasing and technology transfer. Our business units cover iron and steel products, mineral and metal resources, infrastructure projects, mobility, chemicals, energy, foods and retail, healthcare and services business, IT, financial and new business, and transportation logistics, just to name a few. Mitsui utilizes this unique business engineering capability to develop new business models aimed at improving existing business process and generating new opportunities and is committed to sustainable growth and corporate citizenship. Operations are guided by our distinctive corporate social responsibility policy which emphasizes environmental and social accountability and respect for stakeholders and the community. The Mitsui USA Foundation is the philanthropic arm of Mitsui & Co USA for active social contribution programs in communities where Mitsui does business. Established in 1987, it's it currently supports more than 50 initiatives across the United States in the areas of education, community welfare, arts and culture, and employee matching and volunteerism with special emphasis on international education and US-Japan exchanges. More than 50% of its grants target education primarily for college level scholarships forums and Japan research. With respect to JAST events, Mitsui USA Corporate supports the national, the Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival and the Women's Leadership Forum and Network Luncheon. While the Mitsui USA Foundation founded and supports the Mitsui USA Foundation Scholarships in Tennessee program and contributes generously to regional programs, including the Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival, the Tennessee Video Skit and Poster Presentation Contest, the Women's Leadership Forum and Network Luncheon, the Memphis Japan Festival, and the Mitsui Lecture Series, which brings us to this afternoon's event. The Mitsui Lecture Series, series now in its second year, thanks to the generous support of the Mitsui USA Foundation, Subjective is to deepen the understanding of contemporary Japan and Tennessee and create a sense of community and exchange. I can't think of a better way to represent this sense of community and exchange between Japan and Tennessee uh, more than this afternoon's event, learning more about Denso technology and Tennessee. 
Thank you, and back to you, Misami. Thank you, Mike, and thank you very much to you, Mitsui and company, and the Mitsui USA Foundation for the amazing support of JAS that you provide and for JAS programs and events such as the one today. Before I proceed, I wanted to note uh, and uh, extend my welcome to Consul General uh, Yoichi Matsumoto, who is in the audience today. He is the Consul General of Japan uh, of the Consulate General uh, that is located here in Nashville. Thank you, Consul General Matsumoto, for your support and participation today. So our session today is a very timely topic. It is robotics and the future of the automotive industry, Denso, technology, and Tennessee. Now, if the audience has any questions for our presenters, look for the Q&A button on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You may have to hover your cursor uh, over the bottom part of your screen for you to see that button. Once you see it and you have any questions, as I said, for any of the presenters, click on that button to submit a question. The questions will be answered after the presentation as time allows. Now, I'm also delighted to welcome everyone from Denso, including Bob Booker, immediate past JAS board chair and senior manager, government relations of Denso International America Incorporated, who is joining us today as a member of the audience. Hello, Bob. I also want to introduce now our speakers from Denso today, Brian Nolan and Victoria White. And I'll ask Brian and Victoria to please start their video while I am introducing them. First, Brian Nolan. Brian is the Director of Manufacturing Learning uh, who will lead today's discussion of Denso's history in Tennessee the company's use of robotics in manufacturing, and what the future holds for automotive manufacturing. Brian leads development of systems that best prepare Denso's manufacturing resources for current and future challenges of a rapidly evolving advanced manufacturing marketplace. He is based at Denso's manufacturing facility in Athens, Tennessee. Brian joined Denso in March of 1999 as a quality assurance specialist. After advancing through various quality engineering roles, he was appointed to general manager of quality engineering in 2009. Brian later made the transition to manufacturing director of North American gasoline products, and then served as vice president of manufacturing for powertrain products until 2023. Brian holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Tennessee Technological University. And then he le later learned, earned a Master of Business Administration degree from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Our other speaker from Denso, Victoria White, holds a bachelor's degree from Emory University in inter International Relations and Japanese. Victoria participated in the JET program as an English teacher in Shizuoka, Japan and was a Rotary Scholar at Jochi Daigaku, or Sofia University in Tokyo. She has worked in the Japanese automotive manufacturing industry for over 16 years in logistics, sales, purchasing, and now HR at Denso Manufacturing in Athens, Tennessee also. Victoria has been recognized as a 20 under 40 winner in McMinn County, she received the All McMinn Modern Professional Award for Community Service and a National Cadia Award for her work in DNI. Victoria currently serves as the chair of the Athens Isahaya Sister City Committee as a Hope Center board member and on the Athens Park Board. So welcome and thank you, Brian and Victoria. Brian? Brian? Thank you, Masami. Thanks for those uh, very generous uh, introductions. And uh, thanks uh, to JAST for um, sponsoring and helping us arrange this uh, presentation today. Thanks for Mitsui also as well, Mike, for uh, preparing this venue for us to, to speak about what we're going to speak about today. 
Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a bit of a little bit of his, uh, background about Denso. Some people don't know that much about Denso, so for those who don't, we'll give uh, some background there. We'll also talk about uh, the history of Denso in North America, and especially the history of Denso in uh, in Tennessee. So that's where the Denso in Tennessee. And then finally, we'll touch on some uh, technology near the end of the discussion. So let me start with is a uh, large uh, global company, number two uh, automotive mobility supplier, 170,000 associates across the globe. Uh, we're in uh, operating in 35 different countries and regions and about uh, $45.8 billion in uh, revenue annually. Also, you can see our footprint uh, around the globe, beginning with our uh, central hub in Japan with uh, almost 80,000 associates in Japan. Uh, $29.3 billion of revenue. You can also see uh, uh, significant presence in Europe, also in Asia, and uh, finally in North America, which I'll mostly be sp speaking about today. 24 uh, companies, uh, about uh, 23,000 associates, and $9.7 billion in uh, revenue. And uh, the one of the main things I want you to know about Denso today is uh, the main two great causes, we call it, that are driving our business. And those two great causes, we'll speak more about them, but you can find them in the lower left hand side of this slide. They are green and peace of mind. And uh, in these uh, areas of pursuit, we're pushing towards zero. So for example, in the areas of green, we're pushing for CO2 zero carbon neutral, and also we're pushing for zero traffic fatalities. And uh, as I dig down a little bit further, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the scope of green. So, so green, uh, the top level KPI we look at there is aiming to become carbon neutral by 2035. And we're implementing activities around realizing carbon neutrality at our plants, also being involved in the transition to uh, electrified powertrains, both in uh, uh, historical mobility, but also urban air mobility. And then as well around technologies which help our facilities and uh, others uh, around the globe capture and reuse CO2 to protect the environment. Second piece of those two great causes is peace of mind. And I know that feels like a really big uh, pursuit. We all want that, right? but uh, we're aiming to become a leading company that provides peace of mind to society. But we do pick certain channels. Currently, we're working those channels of mobility. As we mentioned, we're pushing towards zero traffic fatalities. Also in providing um, a memorable and enjoyable and a comfortable and free of anxiety uh, experience in the, in the uh, process of, of mobility. And then also we are utilizing our technologies that we've learned over the decades to support uh, people and uh, workers around the world to, to realize their full potential. You can think of these two great causes as they're spread across our, our uh, seven different business domains, the six of which are uh, in the historical automotive business. You can see elect electrification, powertrain, thermal as I go down through here. You can also see the contributions to our overall business and how those contribute to those two great causes. I won't get into every detail there, but also at the bottom, you can see we're also beginning to push into non-automotive businesses very strongly, especially in the areas of industrial solutions, which we'll touch on that a bit today with automation, but also in uh, the, the food value chain. Now I'll drill down into North America. Next page, I'll give you a little bit of history of Denso in North America. A uh, little bit busy here, but I like to think of this page in terms of three, three phases. The first phase over to the left uh, in the, uh, from the 60s up until the 70s was mainly our proliferation of, of our sales um, part of the business in North America. And then from the early 80s up until up until the day, really, but uh, most of our footprint uh, realization happened in, the, in that period from the 80s to the early 2000s, and that's when we began to spread our manufacturing footprint around the region. 
and then the last few years, maybe 10, uh, 10 years or so, we're beginning to also spread our uh, R&D capabilities in order to touch on those technologies which are, which are often leading in this region. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple pages. Here's our overall footprint in terms of the map. Um, you can see the different color codes here refer to logistics locations or production, joint venture companies, R&D, which I'll touch on the next page, and then sales and service uh, outpost. We have 51 sites and about $9.5 billion in consolidated revenues, and as we mentioned, over 23,000 associates in North America. Here's our R&D footprint. And beneath each location, you can also see the technologies around which we have oriented these R&D centers. But we have R&D centers anywhere from Seattle, out in the Northwest, to Montreal, up in uh, Eastern Canada, down into, excuse me, down into uh, Plano, Texas. You can see the different technologies that we are getting involved in and honestly developing uh, value propositions how to utilize those technologies to bring about the implementation of those two great causes that drive everything that we do. And uh, this is where you'll hear a little bit about uh, the future of uh, automotive or mobility in, uh, you know, in North America and in Tennessee. A few years ago, you would have heard from us the acronym CASE, which stands for Connected, Autonomous, shared vehicles or electrified powertrains. And those are, those are depicted in these three upper left-hand panels. But now we've added to that these non-automotive businesses where we're also pushing into uh, wider and more external industrial solutions, as well as pushing into uh, sustainable uh, food supply chains around the world. This is the direction in which Denso is moving uh, around the world, but it's also the direction in which we move in Tennessee. Tennessee, finally, we're down to there. Uh, our footprint in Tennessee is, is a two, two main manufacturing facilities and profit centers there in Maryville and Athens, but I also want to mention that we do have an affiliate company, TBDN, which is Toyota Boshaku Denso in Jackson, Tennessee, which has been over there since the 80s. And also we have a Denso Logistics Center in Nashville, where we consolidate some of our finished products for our customers. But primarily, I'll talk about the Athens facility and the Maryville facility. And consolidated uh, about $4.2 billion in net sales in uh, fiscal year 22. Also investments of $1.4 billion in those two campuses. Over 6,500 associates and uh, 3.4 million square feet inside our buildings and 368 acres of total uh, land being used in those two locations uh, there in East Tennessee. And I want to tell you a little bit of history about each one of these uh, companies, kind of like our origin stories. So I'll, I'll take a couple minutes here. I hope I don't go too far overboard with this time, but uh, the original uh, foray of, of Denso into Tennessee was in great part impacted by our governor at that time, Lamar Alexander. And uh, he uh, uh, was, like many states, uh, in, uh, interested in global investment in the United States at that point in time. And uh, so uh, he had uh, previously been involved in Nissan coming to Tennessee and in, in, uh, there in Smyrna as well. Uh, you know, Honda had come and planted there in Ohio. And then um, the next big player to come was Toyota. And uh, Governor Alexander, Alexander knew about this effort. And so he was involved in that. And it came down to Kentucky and Tennessee. And as you know, they finally landed in Georgetown, Kentucky. And they have a great facility up there doing great things. And one of the Toyota executives told Governor Alexander that they had a, 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 a subsidiary company named Nippon Denso that was also looking to locate to the United States and uh, that he might want to contact with them. They, you know, they might have a couple hundred jobs or something like that someday. And uh, long story short, uh, his team did, did get involved with Denso and they were able finally to locate in, in uh, Lamar Alexander's home state of Maryville, Tennessee. So you can see some historical events here, uh, the governor hosting Nippon Denso team at, at the mansion. Uh, the key to the city event in Maryville there, also in 89, the original round break breaking in 89, some expansion in 92. These are some great historical uh, 
pictures. And uh, Lamar has stayed uh, closely involved with Denzo. His latest visit, uh, I think, might have been even later than this visit. I have a photo here in 2018. So Nip and Denzo's relationship with the state of Tennessee was forged there in the governor's hometown of Maribel. The story about Athens is also interesting. Uh, we had our 25th anniversary here in uh, Athens last year, and I was speaking with the Athens city manager back in those days, Marvin Bollinger. And he tells the story about the fact that uh, Denzo was looking to plant a second, a, like a powertrain uh, uh, manufacturing location south of Maribel. And they were already looking at Cleveland, Tennessee, Okay, I think if I share the other players in this story, but uh, they were they were looking to to uh, locate in Cleveland, and uh, someone contacted Marvin uh, through one of his contacts, told him about the story, what was going on, who the consulting company was that Denzel was working with. And so Marvin reached out to this consultant, gave him a cold call. And the consultant was like, "Who are you, and why are you calling me? And you know, we already have a plan going forward. Please leave us alone." Marvin kept talking. And they kept talking. Finally, Marvin was able to convince them to, to stop by McMinn County and have a lunch on the trip back from Cleveland to the Knoxville Airport there in Alcoa. And so they did. It was a hot August day. And uh, so Marvin and his team set up a, a white tablecloth lunch under a tent in uh, a field here in McMinn County, one of the prospective sites for that, for that location. And they stopped and had lunch. And like I said, it was a really hot day business suits, a lot of sweating. But Marvin's team had prepared also some beer mugs and some cold beer for, for that, uh, after that lunch. And when they broke out the, uh, the uh, frosted mugs and the beer, um, the Denso team loved it. And uh, the, the consultant looked over at Marvin and winked and said, well, you've done it. And that's, that's how it happened. You can see here some great photos from the groundbreaking in 1996 excavation also and construction in 96. And then in the bottom here, you can see some of the launch teams for some of those original uh, uh, processes and even a handover ceremony within the plant there in 97. But this Athens facility was built as a powertrain product center for fuel delivery, ignition products, and exhaust gas treatment. Uh, while in the state of Tennessee over those decades, we've distinguished ourselves in terms of safety, um, safety activities and environmental activities. Hold on one second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Benita, for that. Uh, can you guys still, still see and hear me? Okay. So on the left side, you see some of our uh, awards and some of our activity with uh, the PPP program, which is administered by the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development. We've uh, been certified there uh, three times in about 14 years running. On the right side, you can see we're also involved in the Tennessee Green Star Partnership and are already working on our activities here in the state of Tennessee to achieve that carbon neutrality. Both of our locations in Athens and in Maryville have echo parks, which we use as uh, respite places for our associates during breaks, but they're also used to educate the community about the importance of the environment and how much Denso cares for it. Okay, I'm gonna take a break here and I'm gonna turn the discussion over to Victoria, who you've, who you've met just a few minutes ago, and she's gonna to talk to you about some of our community and uh, Japanese cultural involvement. Victoria, take it away. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Can everybody, oh, I'm still muted, I think. Can everybody hear me okay? Drop something in the chat if you can't, for sure. But my name is Victoria White and I work with uh, Brian at Denso. Thank you again for that nice introduction earlier, Masami-san. Um, so one of the core tenets at Denso is being a contributing member of the local community. So um, one of our core beliefs is getting as involved as we can with the community. Brian, I'm not seeing the presentation. There we go. <laughs> you might've moved forward to the next slide. Great, okay. So as I was saying, one of the core beliefs at Denso is being a contributing member to the local society. 
So one thing that we get really involved with here in Athens is United Way. We've been a top giver for the last 15 years in McMinn County. We also send over 100 associates every year to be involved with the annual day of caring. So we think it's so important to step outside of the walls of Denso and get involved. <laughs> Denso, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so it's really important for our associates to step out and to have those opportunities to be out in the local community contributing. We also love to bring schools on site here at Denso. So we do a lot of local school and student involvement. We do promotion of manufacturing day, a lot of donations to teachers at local schools. Um, as I mentioned, we bring students on site. So the pictures in the very middle of the screen there show one of our engineers, Jennifer Capps, um, doing a hands-on Lego um, activity with some students that came for a visit. We also do a lot with local colleges and community colleges. So we brought um, UTC on site before and also Cleveland State. So we love to partner with those local schools. Directly across the street from us is TCAT which is the McMinn Higher Education Center. It's the Education Center for Higher Education and Local Industry Training. So we do hire a lot of graduates from that program. They have a very strong mechatronics program there for sure. Um, for our government affairs, um, we've hosted Governor Lee on site actually when the McMinn Higher Education Center was opened. And then also um, just being involved with other governmental affairs, Senator Hegarty recently has visited both Athens and the Chattanooga area for business leader breakfast um, meetings. So we've sent representatives from Denso to uh, participate in those. We definitely love being involved with Senator Hegarty since he was a former ambassador to Japan. Some other community involvement. We're members of the Tennessee Chamber of Commerce, the Athens Chamber of Commerce, Etowah Chamber of Commerce, Meigs County, and also Cleveland and Bradley. And we're also heavily involved with the McMinn Economic Development Authority. So just since this is a JAST presentation, we did also really wanna highlight some of our connections with Japan. So the Athens Isahaya Sister City Committee, people ask us a lot, why isn't your sister city Katia, which is where Denso is headquartered? We have, the city of Athens has a really rich history with Isahaya. We host student exchanges. Um, so this summer we've got 19 students coming from Japan to stay in Athens for a two week program. And then next summer we will send American students from Athens over to Isahaya. So the reason that Isahaya is our sister city, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen there, Dr. C.S. Long was a missionary of the Methodist Church from Athens, Tennessee. So he actually started the school in Isahaya, Chinze Gakuin, with a $2 donation from the wife of the president of Tennessee Wesleyan University. Well, Tennessee Wesleyan University is located here in Athens, and Dr. C.S. Long was a native of Athens. So he's actually buried here in Athens. And when our Japanese students come to visit, they actually go and visit his grave, which I think is a pretty neat ripple effect. From here, he started this school in the late 1800s. It's developed now. There is a elementary school, a high school, and a university, all that started from Chinze Gakuin, which he started over there. The lower pictures there show um, the students that visited this last summer. There's a lot of connections with local American students here. You can see the picture with the Japanese uh, students and there's an American boy in the front of that. Um, we actually got a really nice grant from JAS. So we again, thank JAS for that. The Athens Isahaya Sister City Committee got that, but it allowed American students to live in the dorms and participate as counselors for this program with that support from JAS. We definitely appreciate that. The students also came to tour Denso as well while they were here. We also have developed a Japanese culture program that we teach in local schools. Over 1,000 students have participated in this program since 2017. So we go into local elementary, middle, high school, and even college level and teach about Japanese culture. I think since Denso is the largest employer in McMinn County, people in McMinn County are always very interested to learn more about Japanese culture. If you look at the right hand panel of this slide, our expat families get in very, very involved in the local community when they move over here. So a lot of the time they will end up volunteering in the local schools where they're in the US. So the top picture there shows some of our families that um, volunteered at a local family engagement night. And they actually taught about Japanese culture, uh, Japanese new year customs, it was around Christmas time. 
And then the kids get really involved in the school and make great friendships. And, you know, we've been here since 1997. So what I've heard is there's so many lasting friendships that come from the expat families coming and living and being part of the community here in Athens. And then also some other um, Japanese events that we've gotten either hosted here at Denso or gotten involved in here locally. We hosted a tea ceremony last year at Denso with Yuko and Taichi Hikita from Hokkaido, who are masters of the Japanese tea ceremony in the Musha no Koji discipline. So that was really neat because we found a lot of parallels between the precision and dedication and the mastery of the craft and also the importance of doing things the same way every time. So there's a lot, and that's featured in tea ceremony and it's also featured in manufacturing. So we found parallels between those two. So we had those tea masters come on site to do a tea ceremony for our associates. We've also had Japanese ambassador Shinsuke Sugiyama visited Denso and Maryville and previous consul general Kayoko Fukushima from Nashville, the Nashville consul general visited and toured the Maryville College Japanese school. There is a Japanese school that meets on Saturdays at Maryville College. So the expat families can, um, you know, the Japanese, language system and writing system is extremely difficult. So the families or the children that are here on expatriate, expatriations can continue to learn kanji and stay on grade level when they go back to Japan. So that is hosted at Maryville College. The right hand panel of the slide shows we um, do sponsor the UTK J Japanese Business Roundtable and also the Knoxville Asian Festival. That is a huge festival that happens every year in Knoxville that brings all cultures, all countries together in one place at World's Fair Park, but we're very proud that we have been able to sponsor that in the past and definitely are glad to be partners with that and look forward to working with them again this year. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Victoria. We, we really uh, relish our deep uh, Japanese cultural roots and we, we really enjoy our, our Japanese uh, colleagues here at Denso and uh, Victoria does a really great job with that. I'm gonna leave you with one more thing before we step into the technology discussion and that's uh, the Denso spirit. And I'm gonna show an example of how it, how it plays out in, in life and in the community. This uh, panel to the right side here is the, are the, the nine characteristics of the Denso spirit. It's, it's one of the guiding principles of uh, Denso culture and it's categorized into these or collected into these three subcategories of foresight, credibility, and collaboration. And the story that I want to tell is about um, early in the part, in the early part of uh, COVID. Uh, we're talking spring, uh, early summer of 2020. Um, our Maribel facility uh, became aware of the increasing need for, you know, protective equipment. And some of that was face masks, protective face masks for the healthcare um, uh, workers in the community. And uh, Denso in Maribel very quickly mobilized, given our manufacturing uh, know-how and the, the tools that we had there, we began to, to 3D print and assemble uh, face masks for the community. And you can see in the lower right hand corner, uh, in a very short period of time, we were able to create uh, 60,000 shields and donate those to 88 different organizations across 11 states and three countries. And you see here some of the thank you notes from some of those healthcare workers. If you'll remember back to that time, it was a, it was a really frightening time and exactly what PPE you needed, you know, was not clear, but at that point in the time, that was the need. And so in a very difficult situation where our customers were shutting down and, and we didn't have enough business, you know, to keep everybody busy instead of, you know, uh, being discouraged by that, the Denso spirit causes us to find a need to take the resources that we have um, at our disposal and put those to use to, uh, to fill that need. So anyway, that's a little bit about the culture of Denso. Okay, I'm going to switch now into the technology portion and uh, truth in advertising here. I am not an automation specialist. All of my Denso colleagues on here will tell you that. I'm a, I'm a manufacturing leader who has, who has greatly benefited from some really good automation and digitalization over, over the decades. And it's one of the things that Denso does very well. 
my intention today is really to provoke some thought among the audience. It's to show some examples of how Denso utilizes um, this, these type of technologies in, in automation, uh, both in the warehouse and in our plants. And so it's gonna be a short uh, group of videos here and we'll leave uh, plenty of time hopefully for some Q&A at the end. Can you see? Okay, so what we're showing here is uh, in, the, in the warehouse. This is a very highly optimized uh, warehouse space. And what we're talking about here is uh, automated forklifts. You see this forklift here, there's no, uh, it's unmanned. And this particular space that we're picking up from, it's kind of a collection spot for supplied product, which comes in from, from the outside. And this is kind of a congested area. And so the Denso rule to protect our associates, which is one of the main reasons why you use automation, uh, we would only be able to use one forklift in this particular area if it was a manned forklift. But you're gonna see several coordinating here together in this particular space. You see that blue light that was under that first forklift it was actually the footprint of this second forklift that's coming in to, to, to play here in the same particular area. And of course, the work in the warehouse is very dangerous because it's heavy work, it's high work. Both of these those things play together to make it a dangerous place for associates in general. Then when you put into that environment, moving vehicles, it even uh, increases further the risk for safety issues uh, for our associates. So you're gonna see this, uh, automated forklift making a lift here. You'll see on the left coming up in the next lane, there's uh, what we call a VNA, very narrow aisle forklift that, that works in this particular type of warehouse. Some of you may have seen those, but the point here is to talk about how to utilize this small congested space. And you'll see these three different AFLs doing work here. The first one is made a lift and it's heading out for its next mission. And the beacon light for the second, uh, AFL over the left as it begins to uh, start its mission. And you'll begin to see these three working together in tandem uh, in a very uh, polite and uh, safe way, if you will. Hold on, having some technical problems. Okay, let me take you back just a second. You can see the coordination of the three different AFLs here. Um, we couldn't keep this kind of pace of work up if we were using manned uh, forklifts under the Denso principle of safety in this particular congested space. But now with these AFLs, we can do just that and uh, as well keep everybody safe. Now those, that particular activity was in the warehouse alone in that highly optimized warehouse. This next example that I'm gonna give you is more about moving, for example, from a consolidated warehouse like that to a processing area which adds some complications. And we'll talk about those as we go. This is an automated uh, 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 autonomous guided vehicle. Um, and you can see it's carrying a larger load. So when you're, when you're going on these longer uh, travels between, for example, a warehouse and a processing area, you want to be able to, to maximize the load as you go. This particular one here is carrying empties back to that uh, consolidated warehouse that I showed you earlier. Uh, but the point here is a, a very uh, powerful vehicle able to carry these, these heavier loads and yet still uh, navigate autonomously from uh, one point to the other. Here you can see a loaded AGV as it comes down the aisleway. And you'll begin to see the complications with crosswalks here and with pedestrians. There are more pedestrians in the processing areas where the work is done. And so uh, the, the same tools that you might think about on, on autonomous vehicles are also autonomous automobiles are used on these type vehicles. Uh, you can see there as they respect the crosswalks, respect the, the uh, 
pedestrians and that's basically what we might use for a, a longer distance uh, travel from warehouse to to the place of work now within the within the workspace say from from line to line for example the the spaces might be a little more tight a little more uh, difficult to navigate with a large vehicle like that as well the loads won't be as large so we've also implemented AMRs, autonomous mobile robots with smaller size, advanced autonomy, almost like a GPS. So we're gonna we're gonna see some of these working here. You're gonna see one that's coming up, and here in a minute you'll see one coming behind it in an aisle behind it. But this uh, particular AMR is locating the load, lining itself up for the load, and you'll see those two two buttons on the top table of that uh, AMR. They are going to engage the cart. You'll see the cart shift here in a second. Just right there, that shift, it engaged the cart, and now it's ready to, to begin to take that load onto its uh, next destination. <clears throat> One of the beauties of, of AMRs is that it's not necessarily a fixed path, and they are able to navigate a dynamic work environment. You can see that AMR stop for the, for the crosswalk there when the red, red lights came on, and you'll see it do some navigation down through here because you there in manufacturing know well the, the manufacturing space is dynamic and there are detours from day to day if you have constructions or things like that these amrs are able to navigate around those type uh, uh, instances in order to make the most economical path uh, to get the work done you'll see some correction here as the vehicle comes down the lane and it does signal left and right at the end this one will make a left turn so you'll see a signal for a left there now, in those first couple instances, the loads were, were wide enough and the spaces that we were taking them to were wide enough that we could access the load from underneath. This particular load here is narrower, taller also. And for those two reasons, I, I would estimate this load is probably going into an area that's uh, a little more tight. And uh, so we access the load here with this gooseneck type uh, attachment that's gonna be able to uh, access the load and, and move it uh, very adeptly down through the hall. You see it stopped there for the pedestrian. And you can see the safety map or the safety flag there on the top, on, there on the top of these AMRs. One of the things that we found with the AMRs is with their very low profile, even the ones we showed you before with the cart on top, they may not necessarily be able to be seen around the corner by associates. So we're, uh, adding flags and doing things like that in order to make them more visible to prevent uh, inadvertent uh, contact. Now, a lot of those examples I just shown you were actually in Denso warehouses, in Denso processes. This next uh, group of videos I'm gonna show you here is, is not necessarily, these are more like marketing type videos, but they're gonna demonstrate what I want to say. Uh, the point of our automation is to extend the capabilities of our associates and to remove associates from places where they are not so effective. So for example, harsh environments or ergonomic risk or safety risk or high precision work, high speed work and high repeatability requirements that are not able to be fulfilled uh, by the typical human for shift or even a few hours. This particular uh, Application here is a gantry robot inside a CNC machine. And those of you that know this kind of processing will know that in the normal environment, this will be a very oily place, very dusty. Swarf is in there from the work that's being done. So it's not a place where associates would necessarily be handling product. There's also processing going on here that uh, would not be conducive to associates uh, handling product. So this is just one of the examples, harsh environment, dangerous work, uh, where we might implement uh, automation. This next example is a simple bottle capping um, uh, process, but who would want to uh, sit and cap bottles like this all day long? That would definitely be an ergonomic risk for, for associates without automation. But, you know, these robots can can take these caps. There's also a, a quality risk for this product that, that would be inside these bottles, for example. And so the confirmation of the completion of the, uh, the capping process is also very important. 
so this is another very good example where we remove the associate from a dangerous ergonomic situation. This particular one here is an example of a, of a lab situation. And this is not necessarily about uh, safety. This one is about more about precision and repeatability. So you can see here a lab sample is taken and uh, kind of some mixing activity there, lighting below, and then some, some type of spectroscopic uh, evaluations being done of the sample. This particular one here is high speed and uh, repetitive motion. So again, this would be very difficult. I would look like uh, Lucille Ball, for example, if you rem remember her old assembly line bit that she did. But these robots can do this kind of activity all day long at high speed, including this vision to properly orient the product onto that second conveyor belt there. And then this next one here is related to very small products. This is gonna be a pick and place of fuses, very small fuses. And uh, you can see, uh, these are much smaller than you would want to handle with your fingers and plus the, the, the jigs that we're putting them into there, very tight in terms of space. But these robots can pick up this, these two different uh, populations of, of fuses and place them into these jigs for inspection uh, very easily. This next one might relate to you a little bit better. This is a uh, automotive product like a side view mirror that's being inspected uh, by a robot with the lighting that's being articulated by the robot itself. So this is a case where, uh, you know, without uh, automation, you simply could not keep up the pace and the precision of the pictures being taken. Very similar example here of an IC circuit. You'll see the multitude of photographs that are taken and the inspections that are occurring um, in a very short period of time because of the ability to articulate with the Denso robot. Okay, those videos I showed you there were a little bit, little bit older, but they were really good to be able to be uh, separated individual uh, processing steps that we, could, that we could tell easily what the intention was for that particular step. These next couple are gonna be uh, a little more complicated uh, applications of automation. This particular one here, several robots working in coordination. This is a simulated uh, packaging operation for actually for Denso collaborative robots, which is what that, that one robot was picking up there. But you can see you can do inspection, material removal, grinding, pick and place labeling. All these things can be done by automation. Rotary tables where work can be done simultaneously at many different steps uh, and very precise and work that's able to be Confirm. You can see here a team of robots on this uh, mobile track moving up and down just as an assembly line would be. And then finally back to the uh, to the, uh, the simulated packaging operation for the cobot. So these, these are just some things to stimulate some ideas for those that are watching. This next little bit here is about very high speed work. This is our uh, high speed uh, Denso robot. Maybe I didn't mention, but we also, you know, make um, automation solutions, not only for ourselves, but, but for other uh, industry partners. And this is showing about high speed operations, continuous operations, very high speed acceleration, uh, precise stopping. Yeah, I would really look like Lucille Ball on that one. It just, just, you know, amazing work. And then we'll get a little bit of a closer look at the pick and place capabilities at speed. It's just amazing, amazing capabilities by these robots. Now, I wanna stop here for just a second and talk about, I'll call it a hybrid application, but it's basically a workspace where robots and humans are in the same space, working in the same space. Uh, Industry-wide, you call that a collaborative robot or short for cobot. This first example is an actual example in operation, kind of in a, pilot type operation in Maryville. And you can see in this particular one, it's the safety of the robot but because there's, they're both using the same jig in the very center of the operation there. This particular one here, you see the cobot in the background working at uh, safety speed because you have workers there very next to the, to the robot. Typically what you would see in our operation is all these, uh, all this safety guarding. As you look down the line down through there, all these other machines are safety guarded because there's automation inside. But the collaborative robot allows you to implement uh, uh, uses like this without that additional guarding because of the safety that's built into the, to the uh, robot itself. 
And then this final one, I'm going to let it play with audio. It's a little bit of a marketing video, and that's not my fault. But anyway, it, it demonstrates very well the point behind um, the point behind automation and collaborative robots. So I think I need to turn on my share system audio so you can hear it. Safety is essential when humans and robots are working in a shared space. The introduction of collaborative robots has helped ensure worker safety, but often at the cost of performance, slow speeds, reduced reach, decreased payloads. Wouldn't it be nice to have both safety and performance without compromise? Denzo Robotics' latest collaborative robot controllers make it possible. Now you can take any standard Denso robot off the shelf and make it a TUV certified collaborative robot capable of utilizing speed and distance monitoring to maximize safety and efficiency at the same time. Denso Safety Motion defines areas around the work environment and then regulates the robot's activity when a person enters into predefined safety zones. By simply setting up a virtual fence with Denso software and a device like a safety scanner safety mat, or light curtain, you can create a security mesh around the robot. As the operator gets closer, the robot will slow down incrementally. This allows the operator to approach the machine without fear of injury. And if the operator gets too close, the machine will stop. This is the preferred method by safety departments as opposed to other robots that will only stop after they strike the operator. Denso's collaborative robots will then incrementally increase their speed as the operator exits the safety zone, eventually resuming working at full speed. No need for time-wasting resets. Most importantly, Denso Robotics collaborative controllers are compatible with virtually any standard Denso robot, so you can get a collaborative robot that fits your unique requirements. No expensive collaborative grippers or guarding are required. Maximum composite speeds of 11 meters per second can be achieved, and maximum reaches of 2.5 meters and payloads of up to 40 kilograms can be installed. With Denso, you get one of the most reliable and rugged robots in the industry, backed with a free factory four-year warranty on parts and labor. Now, fully utilize the speed and power of your robots without compromising safety using Denso Robotics Collaborative Controllers, one of the most cost-effective solutions to integrate a collaborative robot. For more information, visit denzorobotics.com. End of uh, what I was planning to share today. I think uh, Victoria may be uh, monitoring the the questions that could be coming in. But if you have any questions, what, what I really wanted you to take away from that last bit was the, the two most, the two highest level uh, principles within our manufacturing space in Denso are safety and quality in that order. Most of what you saw in those applications is for the safety of the associate or for the quality of the product. And so that was the, that was really the point I was trying to make. Okay, Victoria, what do you have for us? Well, I do not see any questions right now in the Q&A, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop those in there or in the chat and we will be glad to answer them. Um, it can be anything that you saw from Brian's presentation about automation or anything about Japanese culture. Victoria, we must have covered it perfectly. Like, definitely. Like a rug. Definitely. <laughs> well, I think we need an autonomous driver for my computer, though. I think that's definitely one of the things we need to we need to work on. My driving was a little bit poor today. I, I have a question. Uh, while I'm watching this amazing presentation, Brian and Vic Victoria, I guess it's on just how do you stay on top of all the technology changes that are out there? I know it's just seems like it's lightning speed changes. So is that your research and development team that does that? 
Well, it's that's not necessarily their main mission. Their or their main mission. They those those groups are looking for emerging technologies and emerging needs within society that that could be turned into a value proposition. We do have um, centralized. Uh, uh, we call them uh, production innovation centers, and they uh, have within them uh, experts in automation, engineering, all different kinds of technologies, including uh, you know uh, factory IoT type technologies, and they're basically our our sensors for uh, you know what uh, what is emerging and what be, could be useful for us. So we have a global network of those kind of. Um, groups in each one of those regions that I showed before, kind of coordinated by the central group in Japan, and that's how we that's how we keep our finger on the pulse of uh, technologies. And honestly speaking, some of the technologies have to be developed to create the processes that that we want to use to to make our products. In other words, we are sometimes involved in developing the new you know the new technology in house. Uh, simply to overcome, you know, a, a hurdle that may be in the way of, of what we're trying to do in the marketplace. I hope that answers your question. Brian, we have had a few questions come in. Um, the first was, can you share how some teams name their robots? Well, um, that that one photograph that I showed you <laughs> of the, the AMR, there is a uh, there is a Scooby, Scooby AMR in one of our plants in Athens. In another one of the plants in Athens, there is a uh, there is a team of Ike and Tina. Yes, and sometimes those two don't get a very get along very well. But uh, that's honestly, I don't know how they name them. I know that we uh, it's more fun to speak of an inanimate object uh, with a name than with a number like FMC 02967. So I think it's just, uh, you know, a, a matter of, uh, you know, making a comfortable language and workplace for the, for our staff that are working with these um, pieces of machinery. But uh, I think they have fun with it in, in short. I don't think there's necessarily any uh, uh, philosophy about how to do that. Just have fun. I think you're right, Brian. I believe the associates in the area that the AMRs are in choose the names. Um, some of the other names that have been very popular are um, Short Circuit, uh, Biscuit Train. So we have we do have some fun with those, but it is kind of fun when you see some you know coming with a name. So, um, Brian, another question has come in: Is the R and D for the autonomous technology the same as it is for the case consumer vehicles? Say that one more time, Victoria. I missed it. Is the R and D for the autonomous technology the same as it is for case consumer vehicles? So, case, of course, is the connected, automated. Yeah. Right. right. It, yes, it's it's very similar in terms of the sensing, and also the uh, communication to understand where you know the the coordination of where the vehicle is and you know, landmarks throughout the plant. We, we place landmarks throughout the plant, just like you might see um, uh, in autonomous vehicles. So some of the technology is very similar. So, you know, in, in one sense, th the stakes are not so high, right? These vehicles are not moving at 35 even or 55 or 75 miles an hour. And they typically don't have your children inside. You know that that sort of thing. Not that not that our workers are any less important than than your children, but it's just the stakes are higher. So I think um, probably the hurdle for the technologies for autonomous driving vehicles out on the road in society are even that much higher. And I believe that's why we have seen uh, I don't want to say a pause, but a, a slowing. I think in a way. Uh, in the movement toward autonomous vehicles. It's still happening. It's just more difficult than, than, than many thought in the beginning. Good question. Definitely. I, it's 3.59, so I do think that we are out of time. So thank you so much for the great questions. Uh, and we are going to pass it back over to Mike from Mitsui now. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you both, Brian and Victoria. What a 
like I said before, an amazing presentation. I know we, the one thing I'll say is I was pretty blown away by that Denso spirit story about the face mask, but in general, great, great presentation. So um, I wanna give a lot of thanks to Denso and all of you for joining us today. And speaking for the Mitsui USA Foundation, we are excited about funding the Mitsui Lecture Series. And as the JAST treasurer and board member, I can say that we are very grateful to the Mitsui USA Foundation for the opportunity to present the Mitsui Lecture Series. Uh, please complete our program survey. The survey link is on chat and it will be sent to everyone who attended today. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the JAST YouTube channel. And I would also like to remind everyone about two upcoming JAST events, the Tennessee Japan Forum and Annual Meeting on March 30th in Nashville and the Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival on April 15th. Information on both events is on the JAST website and I hope we see you there. And based on the time we're at now, we're one minute over. Thank you for joining and again, uh, thank you, Brian and Victoria. Bye, everyone. <laughs>